Good morning, everyone. We have a number of updates for you today, so I'll try to be brief. To start, today we've launched another financial assistance program, this one for the child care sector. I've long talked about how critical good quality child care is for Vermont, giving kids a strong foundation and supporting working families. Our child care providers stepped up during the pandemic, staying open to support our frontline essential workers. And for that, I thank you all for your efforts and commitment to Vermont's kids. The state has worked to support these small businesses throughout the pandemic, but we know many of them continue to struggle. So, working with the legislature, we're now offering $12 million in grants for the CARES Act funding we received. This will help child care providers with losses and additional expenses due to COVID-19. So please go to dcf.vermont.gov for details and how to apply. Next, as we focus a lot on the return to school next month, many are wondering what this means for sports. I know how important this is for many young Vermonters and their families. But like so many things during this crisis, fall sports won't be exactly what they were accustomed to. I want you to know we're working with the Vermont Principals Association, the Superintendents Association, school athletic directors and coaches with a goal that will allow all fall sports to move forward in some fashion. This includes cross country running, soccer, field hockey, football, cheerleading, volleyball, bass fishing, and golf. As the VPA has stated, practice will start at the same time the classes start, which is now September 8th. This guidance will also cover Vermont's recreational sports leagues as well. There will be more details uh, from the VPA next week, but I know many have been wondering if there was going to be a season at all, so we wanted to make it clear. There will be. However, kids, coaches, and parents should prepare themselves. Things will look much different, especially when it comes to high contact sports. Now again, this won't be a normal season, but our goal is to offer a path forward for each of these sports to give our kids some sense of normalcy in at in normal times. Before I turn it over to Dr. Levine, Commissioner Baker and Commissioner Pichek to provide their updates, I want to recognize a milestone in our COVID-19 response. As of yesterday, we tested more than 100,000 people. Of those, 1,448 have tested positive. Testing and contact tracing have been critical to our reopening strategy and our ongoing ability to detect and contain outbreaks. While other states continue to see surges and testing turnaround times at national labs are strained, my team continues to do all we can to make sure we maintain and build our testing capacity so that we're always ready to contain outbreaks and protect our most vulnerable. It takes hard work by many to make all these tests happen, and their work is an important reason why the rate of transmission in this state is so low. So I want to thank them, the team at the Public Health Lab, the Health Office staff, the Vermont National Guard, state employees, and EMS workers who have stood up and, and uh, run all these pop-up sites that we've seen throughout the state. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine for his update. Thank you, And other than what you're going to hear from Commissioner Baker about Mississippi, I have nothing to report about any outbreaks within the borders of the state of Vermont. So I'm going to pivot directly from the governor's comments regarding the 100,000 test milestone and talk about testing. Testing's been essential in helping us learn how much the virus is in our communities. And the testing that's happened around the state is reassuring. The data from all of the testing tells us that we really do have low case counts 
and our numbers aren't low just because people aren't getting tested. And how we know this is why I want to take a moment to recognize the months of hard work and very long days put in by our public health laboratory team. Members of the health department team have all but given up their personal lives to process and analyze the literally hundreds of tests that come in every day. The list of individuals is too long to recite, but includes microbiologists, laboratory technicians, administrative and data entry staff, an entire medical technical team that make pop-ups happen in a strategic and timely way, our local health offices, our EMTs, and the National Guard. Our case rates have stayed low in Vermont, and while testing is a valuable tool, it isn't what has kept so many people safe and healthy. You did that. Vermonters did that by staying home whenever possible, by wearing masks in public, and following all of the other prevention steps to stay healthy. It certainly hasn't been easy, especially as the months drag on, or seemingly fly by. I know that for many, caution fatigue is setting in, and it's hard to keep the regimen of precautions and hand washing going. But we need to keep it up because it's working. COVID-19 is going to be with us for a while, and while we all need to keep these basic precautions in mind as we go about our daily lives. But I fear that much of the recent discussion on testing has distracted everyone from some of the fundamental principles. There is much national and local talk about long turnaround times. States that are currently experiencing surges are having long turnaround times on the order of seven to 10 days or more. And a result for a person with symptoms that comes back in that time frame is almost worthless to the person and to the state in terms of preventing the spread of disease. Rest assured that for those who are symptomatic and need a rapid turnaround in Vermont, we have it. The commercial labs are overwhelmed. It's not their fault. They're trying hard under extraordinary circumstances. Fortunately, most of those in Vermont with symptoms are not having their specimens sent to commercial labs. It's unfortunate that many of those who are getting tested who are without symptoms may be experiencing delayed turnaround times. For these people where the stakes are lower and where healthcare practitioners have frequently been sending the specimens to a commercial lab, turnaround may be longer. But to keep this in perspective, we are still able to very effectively practice a containment strategy in the state of Vermont because of testing and contact tracing, which is key to limiting the spread of the virus. We also need to plan now to make sure that no matter what happens, we have the supplies and capacity ready for high priority situations that could pose a serious public health threat, especially to those who are more vulnerable to the serious effects of COVID-19. We see this in other states where surges are taxing their capacity to test and do the contact tracing essential to slowing the spread of illness. As many states struggle with the resurgence of cases, we can expect, possibly predict, a slowdown or shortage of the supplies needed to both collect samples from people at test sites and to analyze the specimens in the lab. And Vermont is not immune, as we said many times before, we expect there will be cases and even limited outbreaks as we very cautiously continue to restart Vermont. With this in mind, we continue to stockpile supplies and we must preserve our ability to test who and where we really need to test. Even as we take these steps, it's important to remember that testing is not prevention. The test that we use, the PCR test, will show you if you were sick at the time when your specimen was taken. It tells you something about that specific point in time, which makes testing a really useful tool to understand. Helps us understand, one, 
the general prevalence of a disease in the community at a point in time. Two, whether you got COVID-19 after a potential exposure. And three, whether the symptoms you are having are truly due to COVID-19. Now that we know from widespread statewide testing that the presence of virus in our state is very low, we must now prioritize our testing, as I said, to these people in situations where testing is really needed. You do not need to be tested unless you have reason to believe you've been in close contact with someone who has the virus or you have symptoms of COVID or have increased medical risk. Again, testing is not prevention. A negative test result does not mean you can ease up on all of the everyday actions we follow to keep the virus from spreading. If you haven't been exposed to the virus, then making sure you follow the core points you've heard over and over again is the best way to make sure you and your loved ones don't get sick and don't need a test. Wear a mask when you go out in public, stay six feet away from people, especially anyone you don't live with to avoid sharing germs. Stay home if you're sick and contact your health care provider. Ultimately, the name of the game is harm and risk reduction. Most activities have some risk. Some activities are riskier than others. It's up to each of us to think about that risk to ourselves and the people we may interact with. Ask yourself before you go, is it worth it to go to the bar with friends tonight, even when you're sick of being home? or to a potentially crowded event or beach when it may be busy. Always think about how you can keep yourself and others as safe as possible. Can you move your gathering outdoors? Can you keep the group on the small side? Keep your risk as low as possible to keep the virus from spreading. We will get through this eventually. And know that we'll continue to review the ever-evolving science and global knowledge about COVID-19. This is to ensure that our policy decisions are based on sound science so that Vermonters and visitors to our state have the most current and actionable information possible. This is public health, and every one of us plays a part in making sure Vermont stays healthy and open. Now I'd like to turn this over to Commissioner Baker. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Good morning. I'd like to take this opportunity to provide an update on the outbreak of the coronavirus at Tallahatchie County Correctional Facility in Mississippi. The general facility is owned and operated by a private contractor, Core Civic who Vermont has a contract with to house Vermont inmates. We've reported that there are 219 inmates at the facility in Mississippi. We also reported that there were 147 positive tests of inmates. After an audit of the test results that came from two separate testing locations, we have determined that there are actually 146 positive tests, not 147. We have, as a practice since the beginning of mass testing of our six facilities in Vermont, done auditing and cross-checking of all test results that are received. It was during the process of auditing the results from Mississippi that we determined there was, individuals list, there was an individual list that was positive that was in fact negative. The numbers are now 146 positive, 65 negative, and eight folks who refused testing. As a reminder of the timeline of events that led up to the discovery of the outbreak in Mississippi, it was the high level of standards used here in Vermont that discovered there may be a problem at Tallahatchie. On July 28, six inmates from Mississippi arrived at the Marble Valley Correctional Facility in Rolla. These inmates all returned through the standard process of inmates coming back to Vermont for programming or release planning purposes. The Vermont Department of Correction had early in the pandemic worked with the Vermont Department of Health to establish science-based protocols that mitigate the spread of virus in our correctional facilities. 
One of those protocols is a 14 day quarantine on, and on days zero, three and 12 testing. The testing of the Mississippi inmates resulted in all six being positive for the virus. These results coupled with a positive inmate test in Mississippi led the Vermont Department of Corrections to request that Core Civic test all Vermont inmates. That, converse, that conversation took place on 7.30 after the receipt of the positive test. During the period of 7.30 to 7.31, it became apparent to the Vermont Department of Corrections staff who had developed an expertise in the mitigation of the virus that the core civic staff lacked the needed testing capacity. The Vermont Department of Corrections started working with the Vermont Department of Health, who in turn contacted their counterparts at the Mississippi Department of Health to build the necessary cat capacity to test all 219 Vermont inmates. Over the weekend of 8-1, test results started coming back that painted a very serious picture of the spread of the virus amongst the Vermont population at Tallahatchie. As the commissioner, I felt the staff of Core Civic did not grasp the meaning of the results or had the urgency required to address the crisis. This resulted in a series of phone calls with me, leadership of POC, our subject matter experts, and the staff of Core Civic. We insisted on a more focused, urgent response to the crisis. Our focus then shifted to medical care with the Vermont population to include the assessment of the level of their expertise of medical staff at the jail, as well as med medical surge capacities of area hospitals. We continue to work with Core Civic to write a new protocol that was specific to Mississippi. We virtually embedded our subject matter experts from both DOC and the Vermont Department of Health and daily briefings with Core Civic. We have then conducted a series of exercises with Core Civic to ensure complete understanding of the updated and specific protocols to deal with this outbreak. On Tuesday, 8-4, a plan was developed to send staff to Mississippi to put boots and eyes on the ground. It was decided we needed medical expertise and operational expertise to validate that everything that could be done was being done to care for the Vermont population. During the day of 8-5, arrangements were made for Dr. Scott Strenio, our part-time medical director, and our logistics chief, Bob Arnell, to travel to Mississippi. Dr. Strenio and Chief Arnell arrived at the Tallahatchie facility mid-afternoon yesterday and provided the Vermont Department leadership team with their first update early last evening. Dr. Strenio reports that he's satisfied with the level of observation, medical care, and tracking of medical surge at three hospitals in the 60 mile radius of the facility. Chief Arnell reported that from an operational standpoint, an early evaluation indicate that the proper protocols appear to be followed to include medical isolation of the 146 positive inmates and the separation of the negative inmates. The eight refusals are being treated in accordance with the Vermont Department of Health guidance as they were positive, even though we do not know they are positive. As of this morning, there are no inmates from Vermont that are hospitalized. Two inmates have been transported to the emergency room due to drop in O2 saturation, but are now back at the jail. There are no inmates, according to Dr. Strenio, who are exhibiting, exhibiting symptoms that are over, overly concerning. Dr. Strenio today will review every chart of every inmate in the Vermont population to do a clinical assessment and identify those inmates at greatest risk. He will then work with core civic medic staff, medical staff to do clinical care plans to meet the expectations of care. Chief Arnell will continue the inspection of processes at the facility today. Last evening, I spoke directly to Mr. David Henninger, the CEO of Core Civic. 
I insisted that the entire facility at Tallahassee be tested without delay. I emphasized to Mr. Henninger that the Vermont Department of Corrections has a high level of success in keeping our six in-state facilities free of the virus through aggressive testing directed by Governor Scott. I also shared that we are successful as we are, thanks in a large part to the low community spread that Dr. Levine just described, especially around the areas that surround our facilities. This is not the case at the facility in Mississippi. Where it is located has some of the highest spread in the country. Core Civic will not get their arms around the outbreak if they do not determine the level of spread amongst the remaining staff and the other inmate population. In closing, I want to assure the loved ones of the Vermont inmates in Mississippi that it is not lost on me as the commissioner the seriousness of the situation and the need for family and friends to have information. To that end, we have established a team to respond to questions from family members. There is a link on our webpage at Vermont Department of Corrections to get current information by leaving contact number or email. My expectation is that a staff member will get back to their family in an expedient manner. We will also be sending out updates via our automatic notification call system to a tallied list of numbers for designated family members. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Baker. And if you could stay on the line, there may be questions after. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Commissioner Pichak for his update on modeling in the Northeast region. Uh, thank you very much, Governor, and, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll start today's presentation again with a look at our national data across the U.S., where we have seen some improvements this week. Um, we'll then overview a recent analysis that our department uh, conducted comparing urban and rural areas and their respective experiences with COVID-19 uh, that will then again turn to our region uh, and to Vermont and close with an update uh, on our travel map. Uh, as a reminder for those watching at home, today's presentation is available on our department's website uh, at DFR, or it's at dfr.vermont.gov. The past week, the United States saw new COVID-19 cases continue to decrease, with the daily new case average falling below 60,000 for the first time in weeks, and with new cases down 10% this week compared to last. We are also seeing a reduction across the country in individuals requiring hospital care, including critical hospital care. And although this data is starting to move in the right direction, uh, it is important to note that averaging over 50,000 new cases per day uh, is still a rather serious situation for the country. Unfortunately, we are continuing to see a steady uh, increase or a steady number of COVID-19 related deaths in the United States. We have reported over 1,000 deaths for each of the last 11 days in the United States, with one analysis determining that an American died every 80 seconds from COVID-19 in the past week, a grim reality that we are likely to continue to see in the weeks ahead. In fact, just this morning, the, the CDC updated its COVID-19 death projections, saying the coronavirus death toll could reach as high as 190,000 by the end of August. The slowdown in new cases though is a good factor and we can see these across each of our four U.S. Census regions with both the South and the West clearly seeing a decline while the Midwest and the Northeast are also seeing a slowdown in new case growth. I want to turn now to that overview I mentioned of the new analysis by our department that looks at any of the differences between urban and rural areas across the country. In the beginning months of the pandemic, COVID-19 infections were far more prevalent in highly populous urban centers. It then spread steadily outward into suburbs and rural communities. This new analysis by our department, however, shows that today there is now no correlation between a state's urbanization and its COVID-19 experience. Even highly rural areas are now showing significant case infection rates. Vermonters have done an excellent job combating the virus, and it's important to stay vigilant, since even sparsely populated rural areas like parts of Vermont can quickly be overcome 
by new waves of infection. The next three maps show our travel zone and the number of active COVID-19 infections within our region among three different levels of urbanization. Again, they appear generally similar with each level, including both very low infection areas and several intense hotspots. Their similarity again underscores our findings that rural areas are no longer safer than urban ones. And again, illustrates that Vermont's COVID-19 experience was certainly not predetermined, nor is it happening simply by chance. We also wanted to revisit a comparison we made uh, in late June between Hawaii, Montana, Alaska, and Vermont. At the time, we noted how similar these four states' COVID-19 experience had been, with each state experiencing a very mild first wave, followed by a period of very low case growth, and then when their economies began to reopen, each saw an increase in outbreaks and clusters. At the time, and as Dr. Levine uh, just noted, we mentioned how important it was for testing and contact tracing to contain these outbreaks uh, and these clusters. Looking back over the past six weeks, we have seen that Montana, Alaska, and Hawaii have each experienced challenges with their testing programs. Generally, test results have slowed down or the amount of testing has decreased, largely attributable to the national increase in cases and the slowdown in commercial lab processing times. An analysis by COVID Act Now also illustrates that Montana, Alaska, and Hawaii are struggling to keep up with the number of new contacts that have been created by this case growth and by these delays in testing, with as few as 12% of contacts being interviewed within 48 hours of a reported positive case. Now on slide 12, we can see the outcome of this situation. When we look at the new case growth in the past six weeks, we see that each Montana, Alaska, uh, and Hawaii has seen a significant growth far surpassing their initial peak and in some days reporting hundreds or even multiple hundreds of cases. Fortunately, Vermont did not follow suit and its EPI team at the Department of Health continues to quick, quickly and effectively respond to outbreaks and clusters. And as Dr. Levine mentioned to his team, this is a real testament to him and Dr. Kelso, the public labs and the entire Department of Health. And again, illustrates how Vermont is not doing well by accident, but because of the hard work of Vermonters and those who are working on their behalf as well. Turning our attention now to the Northeast, uh, we see some more positive news. Uh, we did see case growth in our immediate region slow down compared to last week, albeit slightly at 0.5%. This breaks with a four week streak of week over week case growth in the Northeast. However, there are still areas in our region that we're keeping a close eye on in particular, Massachusetts and Rhode Island, which have continued to see a slow creep of new cases over the past few weeks. Turning our attention to Vermont, we continue to see steady and favorable trends in our numbers. New case growth was just about flat compared to last week with 39 new cases. And Vermont continues to hold the distinction of having the lowest positivity rate in the country. Further, all of our restart metrics continue to look good as well. This week, we saw syndromic surveillance continue to indicate that very few people are visiting Vermont emergency rooms or urgent care facilities, and that remains well below our 4% guardrail. Vermont's three and seven day viral growth rates remain extremely low this week, and again, nothing that would signify anything of significant concern. Again, regarding our, pest, our test positivity, the seven day average remains steady, and as we mentioned, uh, we continue to have the lowest positivity rate in the country. Last, relating to our ICU availability, this continues to trend around the 30% buffer. Uh, and as we've mentioned in the past, with the uh, positive trends with our other metrics, uh, this is certainly not a concern at this time. Looking at a uh, forecast that was run just yesterday evening, uh, we see that Vermont is likely to continue to experience these favorable trends uh, for the next few weeks. The updated model from Oliver Wyman indicates that we are very closely tracking our estimated case growth and that we should expect to continue to see very low case growth over the next few weeks. Last, turning to an update uh, relating to our regional travel map. As mentioned earlier, new case growth has declined in the Northeast, which has translated into more individuals being eligible to travel to Vermont with quarantine-free travel. 
The number now stands at 5.2 million, up from 4.8 million last week. And looking more closely at the counties that changed this week, we see a relatively even mix of counties that have improved uh, or have gotten worse, with particular improvement also in the state of Maine. Again, looking back over the past six weeks, we see the number is still down significantly from the high of a few weeks ago. But we certainly hope the favorable trends we are seeing across the country in the Mid-Atlantic and in the Northeast will mean that more people can be welcomed to Vermont without the need to quarantine in the near future. At this time, I would like to turn it back over to the governor. Thank you, Commissioner Pichek. And with that, we'll open it up to questions. Calvin. Uh, thank you. So um, with students returning back to school in uh, the fall, um, I'm wondering, first off, maybe, Governor, uh, this is a question for Secretary French, if the state is keeping numbers and data on how many schools are either doing in-person instruction, a hybrid model, or, or both. Uh, Secretary French, I don't know if you have any updated information on, on what uh, schools are anticipating in terms of uh, instruction. Yeah, thank you, Governor. Um, yeah, many districts are still finalizing their plans, and uh, we're finding that some of the districts who came out earlier with their plans are now revising those plans. But to your question, Calvin, we do in intend to collect monthly data starting in September on the number of students and grade levels at which students are enrolled in in-person, hybrid, or remote learning. Do, uh, do you have any reflections on what you're seeing so far? No, I think, as I mentioned, it's too early to tell. Um, you know, there are many districts are still revising their plan, um, and some districts I know are, are finalizing them this week. And then another question. Um, earlier this week, you told lawmakers that um, the state is working to build a list of potential child care providers uh, to step in um, should some uh, should there be, you know, a problem with child care? I'm wondering where we are in building that list and also maybe how, um, how you think some of these providers, if they'll cooperate with the state as well. Well, I think, you know, it is the child care issue that I identified, I think, you know, it's on everyone's mind right now. It's, um, it's a significant issue. Um, listening and meeting with a partner at the CDD this week, uh, Child Development Division, who oversees those programs, I know, you know, for the governor's earlier announcement today, uh, we're ramping up our infrastructure to support uh, school districts and the state in this area. And I think it's going to be a critical need, and it's one we're preparing to support both in. David? Thank you. Um, wondering with the grant coming out for child care, if, um, if you all have a sense of the economic impact, if there's been any, um, either from uh, child care providers not having been available during the pandemic or choosing not to be, or moving forward, if this money will help breathe in any more life, or if that's even been an issue. Yeah, um, obviously, uh, this is a, a question that uh, is better for Secretary Smith. Um, but from my standpoint, uh, from the very beginning, uh, we established that there was going to be this need uh, as we came through this pandemic uh, for child care. And that's why uh, Secretary Smith and his team uh, put together a plan uh, to, to subsidize, in some respects, uh, some of these uh, child care facilities to make sure that they're still intact when we got through this and we knew we were going to go back to work and would need them. So I think it's been highly successful. I don't know if other states uh, did what we did, uh, but I think uh, it was essential in, in making sure that we're at the point we are today uh, to make sure that we have the facilities. These uh, additional grants are, are going to be beneficial as well because there's still a lot of need uh, in their uh, business just like anyone else, and uh, they've suffered through this. So. Uh, I think this will this will help, uh, but um, but um, Secretary Smith can expand upon that. Thank you, Governor. I just want to reiterate something that the governor had said. We didn't shut down child care during uh, the pandemic. In fact, um, we established two programs, which were the essential programs and uh, the essential persons incentive program and also the stabilization program the incentive uh, for essential persons 
provided um, extra money for uh, those uh, children of essential workers, and the stabilization program uh, provided money just to make sure that we didn't lose the child care infrastructure that we had uh, during that time. The, those that closed, they needed to sustain their financial s stability and the sustainability program did that. We're now, we also offered, uh, right after we were starting to reopen, a reopening sort of uh, grant of about $6 million. This new operational relief program includes $12 million using the coronavirus relief fund to offset uh, pandemic-related expenses and losses. Um, and I just wanted to, because it's significant what um, this state has done. And, and I don't believe there's too many other states that have done what this state has done in terms of child care. $33 million total uh, out of the, the, the total of these programs plus what we have announced today that the legislature um, has appropriated as well with us in, in this effort. Uh, 30, $33 million, approximately $33 million. That's an enormous effort just to keep um, this economy going and the child care economy going uh, during a time when it was critical to, to uh, move forward. So uh, we've done a lot in this area um, and it's, it's showing signs. We need to do more and there are some things that we're looking at right now um, that we probably will be talking about in the next uh, few weeks or so. Mike, you might as well stay up there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, just add, you've got boots on the ground now down in, uh, in Mississippi. Um, a, how long are they going to be there? Um, are you, do you think this will fix the, uh, or reassure the families of those who are, uh, are incarcerated down there? And um, is there any thought to possibly pulling some of those inmates out of there once they're yeah, let me um, let me turn it over to Commissioner Baker. He's still on the line, um, anticipating those um, uh, those questions. I think you know some of those questions are what we've talked about before in terms of the difficulty of trying to bring back uh, those prisoners in Mississippi during a pandemic, especially when we have quarantined facility the facilities that we need quarantine beds for. Uh, also, as you know, we had a. We went from um, uh, you know 1,600 uh, prisoners down to 1,300. Um, that's starting to creep back up and take more beds as the judiciary opens back up as well. But I'll let uh, Commissioner uh, Baker talk about some of the efforts in terms of boots on the ground with Dr. Strenios and the the uh, director of logistics down there, and also what we're doing with families. I, I think that's important. We, we have to reach out to families uh, to make sure that uh, they're up to date of what's going on as well. Commissioner Baker. Thank you, Secretary. I, I first, um, before I answer those questions, I just need to clarify some remarks I made because I made a mistake. Um, when I talk about the quarantine of new individuals coming into our system and quarantining them for 14 days, um, we test that day zero, 7 and 12. And I believe what I said was 0, 3 and 12. It is 0, 7 and 12 is the protocol we use. So I wanted to correct that. Uh, let me address um, the first question of Dr. Strenio and um, uh, Logistics Chief Arnell. Um, they're scheduled to come back tomorrow. Um, and uh, they'll be working all day on the ground there. In fact, since uh, we've been on the press conference, I've gotten two email updates from Dr. Strenio as he's starting to see um, the inmates um, and checking them, um, medical records and so on. And I'll reemphasize that the doctor is uh, reassuring us back here um, that there's no one that are exhibiting symptoms that he's concerned about. They will return tomorrow. Uh, we'll be getting a briefing from them, a total briefing of the day from them tonight to have a better idea of what they saw and what they accomplished. Uh, and then we'll have a discussion about if we need to send additional staff down next week um, for uh, 
eyes on and boots on the ground. Until we hear that briefing, um, I can't say what my recommendation to the secretary will be about sending other folks down there uh, and increasing uh, my level of trust with uh, Core Civic that they're doing everything they can to take care of the inmate population. So if, if that's a good answer, uh, if that's good for you on the first answer, um, I'll move on to the second point that the secretary was talking about. Um, there's 219 inmates uh, in uh, Tallahatchie uh, in our custody that we contract with Core Civic. Um, bringing them back is not as simple as talking about bringing them back. Uh, here, we do have uh, beds here now uh, that we could bring some of them back. The complication is exactly what the secretary talked about. Um, we have a very uh, well-tested uh, quarantine system set up. Um, we have quarantine units in each facility, and then we have medical isolation if we get a positive test. We have to be very careful that we don't sacrifice beds um, and compromise that quarantining process. I walked um, a legislative committee through some of the numbers yesterday, and the numbers sound like you could bring people back, but once you start cutting into those numbers, it's impacting our ability to quarantine uh, individuals coming into the system. And to the point that the secretary made, um, the criminal justice system has been flat um, for months. Um, we've been monitoring very closely the numbers, our, our total population. As we sit here today, our total population is 1,393, and that includes the 219 inmates that are in uh, Tallahatchie. That number has been going up and down. And what we really watch is the number of detainees, because that's an indication of when the courts start to open up and folks coming to our system are detained on bail. And we have to be very careful that um, we're aware of that because if we start taking those beds up, it's going to start having a real impact on our ability to quarantine. So um, and, uh, where are you at now uh, with your with your level of trust uh, with uh, with Core what? With, with my level of trust with Core Civic? Is that the question? Correct, yeah. Yeah, I, look, I, I, I had a very um, frank and honest conversation with the CEO last night. I think he understands clearly where um, we are, are here in Vermont. Um, I'm feeling better about it, and I'm actually feeling much better after Dr. Strenio has reported um, directly to us um, what he's seen for, for medical conditions there at the facility. Um, so I guess the best way to answer that is my, my trust level is rising. Uh, and finally, uh, is there going to be any uh, monetary repercussions for that lack of, uh, of surveillance? I, I'm not, um, I, you know, I, I certainly haven't even thought about that. Our focus this past uh, seven or eight days are on the welfare of those 219 souls um, from Vermont that are there at that facility. And I, I, I haven't given that any thought, and I certainly haven't talked to the secretary about it. Thanks. All right, we'll go to the phone, starting with Sean Cunningham, Chester Telegraph. Thank you. Um, with schools opening in about a month, there seems to be some concern about the availability of PPE, especially uh, N95 masks. And I know that schools are buying, and they've received some from the state, but they, they seem to be uncertain about the number that they'll use over the course of time. It, what's the state strategy for making sure that there's sufficient PPE available for the schools to get? Secretary French or Commissioner Sherling, uh, maybe um, one or both of you could comment on that. Yeah, this is Secretary French. Uh, thanks, Sean. I'll start. Uh, maybe Commissioner Sherling can add. Uh, yeah, we're uh, we're working hard to coordinate, um, you know, the availability and procurement of supplies such as masks. We were able to, I believe, deploy about 400,000 KN95 masks uh, to the school, um, equated to about 10 per teacher. Um, but we'll, we'll, we're working hard at the state level to, to keep those supply chains open and uh, ensure we can do what we can to help schools in this area. Thanks, and uh, Mike Sherling here. Uh, I would just add, uh, when you talk about the types of masks that are needed uh, for certain kinds of operations, folks tend to migrate to talking about the N95 
Uh, important to note that the N95 is prescribed for use in very specific circumstances when there's folks that are uh, symptomatic or known COVID positive and our primary posture is to prevent the spread uh, of virus into schools and that can be done with cloth masks, uh, surgical procedure masks and KN95s as well. Also of note, uh, the KN95s can be used if fit tested uh, as a, a, a worthy substitute for N95s. Uh, we're testing those uh, prior to them going out so that the test results are available for, for folks that are receiving uh, various kinds of KN95s as well. Um, how many um, how many would you expect to, how many times would you expect a teacher to wear one of these masks in a classroom setting and is there is the state have a procedure for decontaminating these? There are decontamination options available for N95 masks specifically in medical settings uh, relative to the prescribed use case uh, for masks in classrooms. Um, the cans were uh, distributed as a matter of, uh, of convenience. We happen to have um, a stockpile of them, so they're being uh, distributed to schools, but primarily as a substitute um, for uh, cloth masks, which are, again, the, the, the primary use case uh, for most Vermonters is going to be to wear a mask if you're in close proximity uh, to, to other people if, if a mask is not uh, prohibited because of a medical condition. Thank you. Pete Hirschfeld, BPR. Pete, BPR. I apologize. Uh, Governor, this question comes directly from one of our listeners. Um, Secretary Young recently sent out a memo saying that remote work would continue for state employees through the end of 2020. Um, and this person wants to know why is it safe to send school workers and students back into buildings but not state workers? Well, again, uh, I think it's important to note that we've continued uh, with our essential workers in, in this throughout the state uh, system. Um, this just allows more flexibility and more certainty. Uh, we want uh, to make sure uh, that we provide that uh, for our state employees, the option if, if possible, um, when they don't have to come into the, to the settings uh, to prevent the spread. And, you know, if we, can, if we can do all we can, uh, as we're advocating other operations, other businesses as well, if you don't have to come into an office setting, if you can perform uh, the duties uh, that, that are needed, uh, from your home, please do. Uh, and that's what we're doing. We're just practicing what we're preaching. So um, to say that we don't, uh, we don't put people back into, when, when we need our, our essential workers, uh, whether it's our parole officers or DCF workers and so forth, uh, they're out on the front lines. Uh, they're coming in and uh, performing uh, the duties uh, at hand. So um, it's, not, it's not quite the same. I mean, we just don't need to force uh, anyone back into an office setting if we, if there isn't a need for them to be there. Obviously, uh, with uh, uh, with what we're doing with the schools, with the hybrid situation, we're not forcing anyone to do anything they don't want to do. Uh, the schools are working uh, to come up with plans that fit uh, their settings, and um, and they're coming up with all different approaches. Some are uh, coming back into uh, full time, uh, five day a week uh, in person instruction. Uh, some, uh, as we've learned, are going uh, fully remote. And then there's a, a vast majority that are contemplating hybrid uh, situations where they come in uh, for a day or two or three a week uh, and then have remote learning. So again, it's, it's giving the flexibility. Uh, we wanted to make sure that our state employees understood that and give them some comfort, uh, just, like, uh, just, as the, just like teachers have been given uh, the same um, uh, notification uh, from their schools as well. Thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Mike Donahue. All right. 
Last call, Mike. We'll go to Kat at WCAX. Good morning. This question is for Dr. Levine. Do you have any thoughts on the University of Vermont's testing and quarantine plans, and have you consulted with them at all? We know the mayor of Burlington has indicated some concerns with the university's reopening strategy. Hi, Kat. Thanks for the question. Um, we've had extensive consultations, actually, and a lot of their plan comes from the uh, guidance document that uh, was reproduced, with, that has been recently produced and that uh, Richard Schneider actually discussed at one of the press conferences uh, a number of weeks ago. Um, since late March or early April, all of the campuses around the state of Vermont have been meeting with myself and my deputy commissioner um, early on in a problem-solving mode about students who were still here, even though schools were closed. Many of them were international students, some were local students who had nowhere else to go. Uh, and then as time has evolved, everybody began planning when it became evident that schools would be reopening, planning for that process. So uh, a lot of voices at the table, so to speak, uh, a lot of consensus and agreement. Um, but when it, come down to, when it came down to actually a testing strategy and a quarantine strategy, um, we got pretty firm and strict with that, uh, much stricter than uh, you'll see on any CDC guidance documents. Um, and the document we produced really uh, made sure that when students arrive, they are tested on day zero and then on day seven, and that they are quarantined during that time period so that we could really understand what a campus would look like at the time classes were about to begin and try to make sure that um, we had, if you will, a population that we knew about already from the standpoint of presence or absence of COVID, and if it was present, that had been effectively dealt with through a containment strategy. So I think, um, you know, in the city of Burlington, uh, the, the mayor has been very grateful, actually, that a lot of this has occurred. Uh, I think what's come out most recently in the press has been um, a study from Yale, um, or maybe not a study so much as a uh, commentary from Yale, uh, regarding t testing students every two days. This goes for campuses anywhere in the country. Um, and that's an incredibly aggressive strategy. Uh, essentially, you don't go without testing ever, almost, with that kind of a strategy. The uh, UVM practice is going to be weekly. Uh, after this initial test period. Um, in consultation with the investigator from Yale, actually, uh, that person agreed that in a state with such low prevalence, uh, every two days was probably overkill. So in that regard, um, I think they're kind of poised to do the right thing at this point in time, and uh, we're, uh, we're gonna find out very quickly uh, how this initial period goes, because the students are beginning to come back starting next week, I believe. So can the residents of Burlington feel confident that as students return to UVM, there won't be a large virus outbreak in the community at large? Uh, I, would, I would hope so, because the students are being held to a very strict uh, agreement that they have to sign, a contract, if you will. Uh, and there are consequences for not complying with the contract. And of course, part of the contract has to deal with the usual behaviors we're telling everyone to practice. Uh, part of the contract has to deal with more egregious behaviors like having large gatherings and parties and what have you. And the other part has to do with adhering to the testing protocol. Uh, so uh, if there are certainly going to be consequences for not adhering to the testing protocol, that should protect the city. And just having the testing protocol and having uh, a partnership with the health department to make sure we manage any positive tests that come out of that uh, should be comforting to the city as well. Um, so in, in that regard, I, I can certainly speak. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to go back to Mike Donahue, who I believe is on now. Mike? Good morning. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Yeah. 
morning, Governor. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, governor, the uh, Ohio governor became the second governor to test positive for COVID-19, although a second test last night, I guess, now that he is negative, his wife and staff were tested. Just wondering how many times, Governor, you have been tested since March, and when was the last time you and your staff, say, including Dr. Levine, have been tested? Um, I can only speak for myself. I know uh, some staff members have been tested. Uh, I have not been tested uh, to date. Uh, I've been adhering to the standards that I'm asking others uh, to to adhere to, um, and uh, that is to keep my distance, wear a mask, and and uh, I don't come in if I'm sick. Uh, so uh, at this point in time, I haven't felt it necessary to have a test. I'd rather leave those tests uh, for others who are in need. Um, I would comment uh, a bit on uh, Governor DeWine, uh, send him my best. I hope, um, I hope the second test is the right one, uh, that he is negative at this point. Uh, the first test that he had was, I believe, an antigen test. Uh, the second was a PCR test. And as you might recall, we had some issues uh, in here in Vermont uh, with an antigen test. So they aren't uh, foolproof. Um, so we'll have to wait on the results and why that happened. Uh, but, but again, uh, my, uh, my staff uh, has, uh, has uh, been uh, adhering uh, again uh, to all the guidelines, uh, wearing masks, uh, staying away from, from others, staying separated, physically separated. And uh, we've rotated our schedule a bit and not everyone is in uh, at the same time. So uh, I don't know about Dr. Levine. Um, I'll let him answer himself on that. And, and have anybody, has anybody tested positive on your staff to your knowledge, uh, not coming to work for a while or? Yeah, not, not to my knowledge, no. Dr. Levine. Hi, Mike. And I likewise have been here, adhere to all of the uh, standards that we set in terms of uh, behavior patterns, et cetera, and uh, do a self uh, symptom check every morning, if you will, and a temperature check every morning, um, and uh, have not been tested. And uh, would certainly seek testing if uh, appropriate. Uh, I've actually been to some of the testing centers, uh, more uh, in my capacity of just uh, cheering on my team uh, than anything else, but had the opportunity to be tested if needed, but again, in this time that we want to preserve as much as we can for supplies, uh, I would only do so if I uh, needed to. Great. And Secretary Moore, you were not on the line the other day when the question was asked uh, about whether the state will treat high school sports and recreational leagues the same. Just wondering if you could give a response to that. And I know the governor mentioned some high school sports won't look normal. We're hearing high school football going to be possibly seven on seven passing game with no blockers or the center hiking the ball. Can you give us an idea of what are some of the other hurdles that these sports, soccer, field hockey, whatever, cross country are going to be facing? Sure, I'd be, I'd be happy to. Um, as the, the governor indicated, there is work both with the VPA as well as recreational sports leaders. Uh, to develop an approach that will allow as many, if not all, sports to move forward. We have identified a path forward for all school-based, high school, high school-based fall sports at this point, um, and work is ongoing with recreational sports leaders. Uh, obviously, the, the higher contact the activity, um, the more interested we are in looking at potential modifications that can ensure physical distancing to the extent it's practicable, um, and also minimize the, the need for contact. Um, those discussions are underway and look forward to having more to share in that space, um, hopefully as soon as next week. And I might just add that the, the intention is to ensure that there is consistency um, between the, the modifications proposed at the high school level and the expectations for recreational sports uh, leagues in Vermont. But just to be clear, I mean, obviously, seven on seven is a big change in football. I'm just wondering what soccer, field hockey, you must have some at least preliminary information on what those are going to look like. 
we we have started to have have those conversations, including considering considerations related to masking and other strategies that can be deployed in terms of, of specific parts of play um, that are are higher contact in ways that games might be modified. Right on through looking at cross country running events and the the mass starts um, that also result in a significant amount of congregation and how we could do those in a different way. Great. Thank you very much. Mike, if I could also You're offer, um, we are as concerned about uh, off the field as on. Uh, so we're looking at different strategies in that respect, whether it's the locker rooms or on the sidelines uh, and so forth. And so that's a, as important as it is on the field. So we're looking at all aspects. And I know uh, the other leaders are looking that, at that as well. I, did, I also wanted to add that uh, I'd forgotten um, to mention that uh, I, too, uh, check my temperature every single day and uh, to make sure that there's no change uh, in, that, uh, in that respect. Great. Very good. Thank you very much. All right. Eight three WCAS. Governor Scott, we're still hearing from a couple of people who are a bit frustrated with the DMV and how all the locations are not fully open. Commissioner Manoli has said that they are working on an online plan to hopefully reopen all of their services um, soon. But we're wondering if businesses can be at 50%, why can't the DMV open their offices and their counters um, with that same guideline? Well, don't forget, uh, Avery, uh, we've never really shut the DMV down. Uh, we do have an online operation we need to enhance that and i think it if anything it highlights the need that we need to do better in that regard we need to do more um, and so it's something we want to enhance uh, we want to alleviate uh, some of the weights as well we're, we're contemplating uh, some action there that would uh, would be helpful but we do want to uh, open up when it's uh, when it's safe to do so and and we think we're getting there uh, we want to make sure the employees are safe and feel safe coming in and we're we're setting up the operations to do just that. So uh, I would expect uh, we'd be opening up in some capacity at our DMV locations throughout the state in the very near future. I'd hoped we'd, uh, we'd be open uh, before now, uh, but it just hasn't uh, risen uh, to that level. And uh, we're working at it. And uh, we hope, again, uh, to, to point people in the direction of if you can do it online, uh, don't come in. Um, that would be the best approach. And if we can give any flexibility in terms of uh, some of the dates, uh, the renewal notices, and so forth, uh, we'll, be, we'll be doing more of that as well. Is there something specific about the DMV and safety-wise that's holding you all back from opening it up as, as compared to businesses being at 50%? No, it's just, uh, it's, it's just how it's done. Um, I mean, in the DMV, uh, if you've been in, uh, Avery, very uh, confined areas, uh, to, be, to be perfectly blunt, um, and come at different times when people have to wait uh, a long period of time. And we're, we're trying to figure out what's the best approach to prevent that from happening. Uh, you know, whether there's a, uh, there's a way uh, to, uh, uh, to do that uh, so that we don't uh, unnecessarily put people at, uh, at, uh, in, in the way of harm, uh, as well as our employees. We're just trying to get that figured out because, it, it, you know, we we have peak periods uh, at different times of the month, uh, during uh, during different times of the day, and we're just trying to figure that out so that we can mitigate that. Thank you, Guy Page. Guy Page. Governor, James Ellers of the Lake Champlain International reports that through August 5th this year, there have been 150 sewage and water pollution spills in Vermont, totaling 12 million gallons. He also says 12 spills of 2.3 million gallons from in Burlington alone. Separate from whatever is being done about reducing dairy runoff, what is your administration doing to reduce municipal sewage dumping? Yeah, again, uh, some, of the, some of the things, the approaches we've been taking uh, over the last 20 years uh, is uh, trying to reduce the amount of uh, stormwater uh, that goes into uh, sewer treat treatment plants uh, to, to 
reduce the amount of, of capacity uh, there uh, because that's what we see mostly when there's a surge and we see with climate change, climate change real, uh, we're seeing more intense storms, we're seeing it all come at once uh, and that's why it's important to take the steps we've taken but go further as well. I might, uh, I, I know Secretary Moore is on the line and she's, uh, she's our expert, resident expert obviously on this uh, issue and maybe she could, uh, she could answer the question much more succinctly than I can. Sure. I'd be happy to, Governor. Uh, I think the, the points you, you made are spot on. Uh, these systems generally were historically designed to carry wastewater and stormwater in a single pipe system. And it means when we see frequent and intense rainfall events, we unfortunately also see more sewer overflows. Each of the communities in Vermont that is served by a combined sewer system has a long-term control plan to address and ultimately eliminate those overflows. Uh, they also have what's called a 1272 order that's issued by my agency that has them on a compliance schedule. These are expensive and technically challenging uh, infrastructure projects to implement these corrections. As you might imagine, these are pipes that lay under not only roadways, but buildings, yards, and have numerous connections. Um, so we are, we are working actively in each of these communities to reduce the number of overflows. But the governor's point about our changing climate complicating or exacerbating um, these conditions and the need for this work is, is very accurate too. Um, any, any new initiatives expected on this? Something to, to, to ramp up what's being done? Because it sort of sounds like that is slow. There is uh, a significant book of work underway both at the, um, with municipalities uh, using bond funding and other capacity as well as money that's allocated to the state's clean water fund um, and some federal funding that's been brought in to address water quality concerns that, that's all being allocated to different aspects of this. Um, largely focusing on ways to capture that stormwater before it enters the sewer system and treat it that way. Um, as opposed to having it mixed with wastewater and result in a combined sewer overflow. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, Governor, yesterday... I, I just might, uh, might also add uh, that uh, all of this obviously takes uh, resources and uh, we mm -hmm. are challenged on a national level in terms of infrastructure improvement. And when we talk about infrastructure improvement, uh, many times we, many people just assume our roads and bridges, uh, but it really is about our water, sewer, storm, uh, systems as well as uh, our broadband uh, capacity. So we have infrastructure issues uh, in our country. Uh, we need to take this opportunity, I believe, uh, to, to focus on that. And, uh, and I know many have been, uh, but uh, we have to take this seriously. This is, this is our challenge of the future, is our infrastructure throughout all sectors. Thank you. Uh, Governor, yesterday, Senator Ash and Speaker Johnson both committed to delivering a fully funded Global Warming Solutions Act to your guests after the legislature reconvenes. Can you indicate whether you would veto this bill? And if so, uh, do you think you could, uh, uh, do you think it would be sustained? We've, uh, first of all, um, in its present form, uh, I've said th that I'm not in favor of it. Uh, we've offered many, many uh, solutions. Uh, we, uh, we've offered uh, ways to make it and enhance it, make it better from our standpoint. Um, if they're willing, if they're willing partner uh, in trying to, to get something passed, I think we could make that happen. Uh, but if it's just to, uh, to jam this through, so to speak, and, and, uh, and force my hand, um, I'm totally willing to accept that as well. But. Uh, but I, again, there's a path forward. Uh, we just have to, uh, to work together in order to do that. But, but I, I don't have the answers um, in terms of whether if, if a veto uh, became necessary, whether it could be sustained or not. It would depend, obviously, on the votes. So um, you, know, you probably know as better well as I do uh, what the outcome will be. I just, don't, I just don't know at this point in time. So you're saying that if, if they, they don't make any changes, um, you're likely to veto it well, if they don't work with you in this? Again, I, we've offered uh, a path forward. Uh, we have some uh, areas of disagreement, and uh, we believe that there's some solutions that could be put into place uh, to, to make it palatable. So um, we're willing. We just need to, need to make sure that we're all working together in order to do that. 
What are some of those areas? Um, well, in terms of uh, the litigation aspect, uh, that's a uh, that's that's a problem from my standpoint. Um, opening ourselves up uh, to that, uh, we'd be vulnerable uh, to uh, lawsuits uh, in that capacity, and I just don't think that that helps uh, in in trying to uh, to solve the problem that's uh, that that we have before us. Ask my question without a machine going off. Thank you, Governor. All right, Ann Wallace Allen. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Um, this is a question for Commissioner Baker. Um, I wanted to ask what kind of conditions the positive, the 146 positive inmates are living under. Are, are they on lockdown? Or just, can they make phone calls? You know, things like that, like their families, recreation. Yeah, th thank you for the question. That was a little hard to hear, but I think what you asked me was, what are the conditions of the 146 inmates that tested positive about locked in and conditions and so on? And, uh, exactly. And so he just started up a very loud machine out my window as I started asking okay. the question. I, I, I've got the question. So um, the 146 inmates are separated um, into two separate areas, um, isolated. What I would call medical isolation. Um, normally, um, we go, if, if we have a situation similar like that under our protocol here, we go in a lockdown. They have been in a lockdown um, with these circumstances. And as of late last night, we were starting to have conversations with them about um, allowing people out for showers um, and allowing contact with family members through phone calls. Um, but we've got to assure, we've got to be assured that they're following the protocols, for example, cleaning the showers um, at, on a regular basis after use and um, how they would handle phone calls um, with the phone um, by cleaning the phone and so on. So um, I do know that there's conversations going out with my staff with the folks on the ground in Tallahassee and uh, I'm hoping that we can figure out something so those folks there have contact with their loved ones. In the meantime, as the secretary said, as the secretary said, we've invested a significant amount of resources internally to facilitate communication between the families and and where the uh, inmates are as far as their conditions down there. Um, what about like recreation opportunities? Is there any way for them to get out? No, no. no as part of the protocol, um, you know, again, they have tested positive. Kind of ties back to questions and conversations around sporting events and mitigating the spread. So um, I, I, hope, I, I will double check this, but they should not be out in rec time or participating in sporting events until we move through this period of 14, 14 days of quarantine or medical isolation. Excuse me. Um, thank you very much. You're welcome. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Thank you, Governor. I wanted to ask about GW Plastics and sale. I was wondering if you had a reaction to that. And the second part of that is, in the last few years, there's been a lot of Vermont companies <clears throat> that have been sold uh, to national or international companies, uh, really more than, than in my experience doing this in the last 30 years. And I was wondering, you know, every, every company needs to transition at some point or be sold, as, as you well know. I was wondering if you had uh, any ideas about what's going on or how that might impact the Vermont economy. Yeah, it does seem to be the way of the world. I'm not sure that it's just uh, isolated to Vermont. I think we're seeing that uh, throughout the country, uh, many uh, businesses being uh, bought out uh, by uh, larger companies and, uh, and combined. Um, and some of that could be a, a strategy in terms of, of, of reducing competition, but it seems as though there's always an opportunity for someone else uh, to pick up and, uh, and go into business to compete. So um, I, uh, my, my initial reaction is uh, GW Plastics has been a, a, great, uh, a great partner, a great business here in Vermont. Um, and, I was, uh, and I don't know any of the particulars. I wasn't uh, notified beforehand. Uh, but from what I understand, uh, the operations will not change. 
uh, which is good news. They're going to keep the leadership uh, staff here, uh, and they're not uh, they're not moving away from Vermont. So uh, my uh, priority, obviously, is trying to grow the economy here in Vermont, uh, keep people employed, and uh, and uh, and if they are committing to that, uh, they have to do what's right for the for them. Uh, the owners have to do what's right for their for their business. Uh, but it sounds as though. Uh, this is a solution that will um, will keep the business here in Vermont. So, uh, from that standpoint, uh, uh, I'm somewhat satisfied. But um, but look forward to to speaking with the new owners uh, once they uh, they come aboard. All right, great. Thank you. Eric, Hans Argus. Yes, this is for Secretary French. Is there any timeline for when schools might receive uh, pre-K guidance? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, we've, we've put out pre-K guidance uh, throughout the emergency response. We are in the process, I would say, of harmonizing that guidance with our reopening plan. Uh, so we should have something out that can along those lines here within the week. Okay, thank you. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. <laughs> Um, hello, this is another question, I believe, for Secretary French. Um, you were talking about um, PPE earlier, and I'm wondering whether any thought has been given, especially for teachers in the lower grades, uh, for finding ways to supply educators with trans parent protection so young children can see their teachers' faces. I've been told that um, educators find that that is very useful to give students clues about how they're doing. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, our guidance does anticipate that need and does allow for the use of screens, uh, if you will, um, or shields, in that, those kinds of environments where the educational needs uh, uh, really um, support that, that kind of approach. Thank you. Greg, County Courier. Greg, the County Courier. Hi, can you hear me? Ken. Oh, thank you, Governor. Um, I was comparing the state of New York travel restrictions with here in Vermont, and it appears that their travel restrictions uh, amount to 100 cases per million, which is uh, basically four times more strict than Vermont. Um, and, and it also means that in Vermont, if we got to uh, 62 cases in a, in a seven day period, it would, it would turn off travel to all of Vermont. Uh, by my calculations, we've had about 40 cases in the last week, uh, which would mean a small cluster like Reduski could push Vermont over the edge pretty easily. Um, also looking at some, some of the numbers in Vermont, about half of our counties would not uh, be allowed into New York if it was calculated on a county basis and not a state basis. I'm wondering what some of your thoughts are on uh, some of that information, some of that data. Well, first of all, I hadn't heard uh, that they were uh, 100 cases per million. Uh, that would that would surprise me, um, because some of the some of the I, I guess some of the states they've restricted, and I and I believe they're doing this on a statewide basis, uh, not on a county basis. But um, but that number doesn't sound right to me. Uh, I might ask Commissioner Pichek if he could maybe. Bring us up to speed on that. So, so I can actually read for you off the. Uh, I'll go back. The Health Department website. This is it's based on seven-day rolling average of 10% uh, positive cases or number of positive cases exceeding 10 per 100,000 residents, which would be 100 per million. Yeah. So. Um, 
Greg, just, this is Mike Pichak. Um, we did an analysis of what the New York travel restrictions would look like compared to Vermont, and we also looked at what the EU's travel restrictions were compared to Vermont as well. Um, and we did find that the New York standards were considerably less restrictive than Vermont, uh, although the EU standards were slightly more restrictive uh, than our state. I think three or four weeks ago, we showed a map of what it would look like under the New York standard versus what it looks like under Vermont, and then what it looks like under the EU uh, as well. And you can see that under the EU standard, more counties would be shut off to travel uh, to Vermont without a quarantine. But under the New York standard, almost every county in our travel map would have been open uh, to travel uh, into Vermont. So the standards in New York are, in fact, significantly less than Vermont. Um, I can go into the, the details of the calculations if you want, but, um, you know, I think, uh, I think maybe just there's always usually confusion about whether certain numbers are, you know, on a daily basis or on a rolling seven-day average. Um, so uh, uh, we can actually probably um, get you the map as well. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Uh, I think that's it for the weekend. Uh, and uh, have a great weekend, Governor and Commissioner. Thank you, Greg. Austin, Burlington Free Press. Hi there. Um, I was hoping to follow up uh, about uh, fall sports. And the first thing, and this is either, either for the Governor or uh, Secretary Moore, but I was hoping uh, to get a clear idea of when or under what circumstances games could begin this fall and also in the same vein, uh, what would cause them to be abandoned. I, I think the terminology that's been out there is step two versus step three. And I, I have no idea really what that time frame would look like. And then just hopefully wanted to get a better idea of what the, the lay terms for those, uh, the difference in those two steps. Um, I might ask Secretary Moore if she could uh, if she could give us some clarification on step two and three. Sure, I would be happy to, Governor, and, and we'll ask Secretary French to, to add in as, as necessary. The step one, two, and three are laid out in the Agency of Education's Strong and Healthy Start guidance, and we are anticipating that all schools statewide will start in under step two. Um, under step two, schools will be able to begin practices, um, but interscholastic competitions would be held back until all schools reach step three. Uh, the decision to move from step two to step three will be made um, by the Agency of Education in consultation with the Department of Health and is anticipated to be um, about two weeks after the start of school. It all goes according to plan. Um, we are also thinking about what happens um, if there are uh, confirmed COVID illnesses in the, the school um, and what that would mean for school-based athletic activities. And I, again, intend to tap and tie that um, with those steps in the Agency of Education Strong and Healthy Start Guide. Yeah, this is Secretary French. I don't, I don't have much to add to that. Um, I think, you know, once again, as Secretary Moore stated, um, there's a connection uh, between uh, the health uh, provisions that schools are providing and the ability to offer these programs. Um, so it's our hope, uh, you know, we're being very cautious in opening school at step two, which is our, um, our step that requires the most stringent health precautions. Uh, but all, if all goes well, we'll be moving to step three fairly quickly um, in the school year. Okay, and I guess uh, as a follow-up on that, so it, we would need all of the all the schools to be able to get to step three to start competition uh, between schools, but if one or two schools can no longer be at step three because of illnesses, would that preclude all schools from competing or just the individual schools where that's the case? The intention would be to have that up. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dan. No, you go ahead. That's fine. Uh, the intention would be to have that that um, be a, a district by district basis, with the decision being made by the local superintendent in consultation with the Department of Health. Yeah, I, okay. I think, great. Yeah, it would really the the individual school might not be available to compete, but the other schools would be able to go forward. Okay, and I, the the last thing is, is with the sports for today, I, I was just curious. Uh, about how the process of allowing 
sports and competition this summer has informed the process for approaching fall uh, school sports? Uh, certainly, we, we've been paying attention to how, how sports have gone this summer um, and feedback we've received, um, I think, by and large, is the recreational sports league have done a great job adhering to the, the guidance. Um, there's certainly some examples nationally of, of concerning conditions that have developed as a result of sporting events, and even though it's to date, I we think we've been very fortunate here in Vermont. And so it's incorporating both what we've seen um, in terms of areas where additional clarity might be helpful, as well as uh, additional precautionary measures that, that we believe it makes sense to, to put in place, um, given lessons that are being learned elsewhere um, that we hope to not have to, to repeat here. And if I might add, much like our schools, with the lowest number of cases in the nation, the lowest positivity rate in the, in the nation, if Vermont can't do this part uh, and open up, sports then no one can uh, because we are in a great position uh, and if we as long as we can <clears throat> keep it confined within our state borders i think we'll be we'll be okay thank you aaron bt digger All my questions were asked, so I'll just pass. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Steve, NEK TV. Steve, NEK TV. Yes, can you hear me? I can. Um, okay, uh, one for the governor and, and one for Julie Moore, if I may. Um, Doug, Governor, first I'd like to thank Rebecca for getting um, the, the prison, uh, the prisoner data to me uh, so quickly. Uh, to, uh, she's incredible. Um, uh, but um, when I was she's not disagreeing, that, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. Uh, when I uh, when I had talked uh, about this um, with um, some retired uh, uh, counselors and stuff. Um, I, I got the, it, the, the feeling or the, the, the inclination, they don't have the rough data, of course, that a lot of these uh, crimes, violent crimes and other crimes, um, are, are alcohol related or could be attributed to alcohol or there was alcohol involved. Um, if we were, uh, if, if, if the state's talking about like a 30% tax on, on cannabis, uh, and, and it, would we be able to track uh, the, the prisoner data um, to find out how much is alcohol related and would an uh, increase in alcohol tax be something you might want to look at? Um, well, substance abuse of any type is an issue uh, and does, um, I think, add to <clears throat> some of the level of uh, incarceration that we see. Um, but uh, we do a lot in the state in terms of uh, prevention uh, techniques. Um, but I, I, I don't know uh, that a, I, I'm, I'm just not sure uh, at this point. We're, we're doing uh, a great deal. Opioids has been a, a huge issue for us. It was with the previous administration, is with us uh, at this point in time. And uh, we need to continue uh, to fight that battle. Um, but, uh, but alcohol as well as uh, uh, other uh, substances as well um, have been problematic so we'll continue uh, to do all we can but uh, but I'm not sure that you know raising a tax is necessarily going to fix the problem yeah well, well with with opioids as I'm sure you know uh, the, you know if you discontinue opioids uh, after three days of you know pure health you're going to come out the other side and you're basically be okay whereas if you've been drinking alcohol for years and years, and you stop without uh, being medically supervised, uh, you can have seizures and uh, actually like die from it. Yeah, I, uh, I, I was just one. I might, I may, yeah, I might make the point that uh, I don't think three days of uh, of going uh, cold turkey with opioids uh, fixes the problem. I think it's an ongoing lifetime effort. Oh no, yeah, but yeah, of course, obviously. But I was just wondering if the state could you know, maybe track the, how, how many of these crimes were, were, were alcohol related. 
we we may now. I, I just I just don't have that information. But uh, does anyone else have anything to offer on this? We can. I want for we Julie, take, if I we, may. Go ahead. Um, Julie, uh, I got the uh, um, the re uh, report from the uh, state auditor's office uh, about the phosphorus, and um, uh, towards the end, he says that the the state can't, uh, the agencies can't measure the phosphorus reductions for either combined sewer systems or natural resource projects, and that 95% of the clean water expenditures didn't yield any measurable phosphorus reductions. Um, uh, how can we, uh, if we're not, if we're not measuring, if we're, if we're, if we're not measuring any reductions, uh, then how can we, uh, how can we get to the EPA mandate? Uh, thank you for that question, Steve. And, and I would say that that's, that's a point of contention between the, the agency and the auditor's office in terms of, of exactly what it means to be able to quantify um, the types of reductions we're achieving. Uh, certainly at, at the highest level, each of the projects we're implementing, we're able to model and estimate the pollutant reduction that's achieved using uh, design standards and literature values. Uh, we also know that ultimately we need to be able to measure the impact that our work is having on water quality in, in the lake and we have established a, a robust long-term monitoring program in cooperation with the Lake Champlain Basin Program, uh, the province of Quebec and the state of New York. We are tracking uh, phosphorus loads at the mouths of each of the major tributaries to the concentrations in the lake itself and are able to look at, at long-term trends um, in the aggregate, obviously that's not, not project specific. Um, we are also always um, in the, the effort of improving our ability and our science around estimating pollutant reductions associated with specific projects. And when it comes to the natural resources restoration work, um, have an active contract with the University of Vermont um, where they are, are working with us to uh, quantify the phosphorus reductions associated with wetland um, restoration practices and floodplain restoration practices that have been implemented using clean water funds collecting actual in the field data, um, which we know will, will better refine and inform our estimates going forward. Um, so it, it, it is a work in progress, um, but also believe that, that we have tools currently at our disposal that give us the confidence that we need to know that these are important investments and will ultimately um, move us towards those, the goals laid out in the pollution budget to reduce fossil. Sure, and, and I'm sure you know that uh, it, there are the, the two worst uh, worst streams in the state. Uh, number one is, is Potash Brook uh, down in your way, uh, near Burlington rather, and. Um, and, and the second worst is uh, Mud Creek uh, up, up here where I'm at, uh, and there's only, you know, a couple of a couple of large farms left, and um, and we, we're still seeing, you know, uh, spreading liquid manure uh, uh, on rain, you know, and on days before heavy rains, and right next uh, up to and next to streams, uh, buffer zones that are practically nil. Uh, is there any is there any uh, way we could you know maybe tighten this up a little up here? The, the types of um, practices, the field-based practices that you're describing, are um, depending on the size of the farm, subject to, to different requirements that are administered by the Agency of Agriculture through its small, medium, and large farm operating permit program. Um, so absolutely, if you're seeing locations where there are buffers that are, that are missing, that is inconsistent with, with policy and law, um, and would encourage you to, to follow up with specifics, and happy to, to coordinate with the Ag Agency and have one of our inspectors go out and, and take a look at the site, because that, that shouldn't be happening at this point. So I'd have to get photos and send them along to AAF and on. Yeah, you can hear or to me, and either one of us um, would be happy to follow up. Okay, great. Uh, thank you all very much. Kevin, seven days. Can you hear me? We can. 
Thank you, Governor. I think most of my questions are for uh, Commissioner Baker, if that's all right. That's fine. Commissioner Baker, um, I appreciate the availability you've uh, had uh, over the past week uh, for members of the media um, and today as well. Could you give me a little greater sense of how many of the open beds in the state of Vermont you think could possibly be repurposed to house uh, inmates who are presently in Mississippi. I know you mentioned something uh, yesterday about 115 beds for men and 47 for women, if I have that right. How many, do, how many of those do you think could be um, put back toward use for um, Mississippi inmates? So it, 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 I appreciate your comments, Kevin, about being available, and I appreciate um, your patience with us getting back to you, because I know you have some other requests of us, and we'll get back to you with those. Um, what I said at the legislative testimony yesterday was, um, as of yesterday, it was 115 male beds and 46 um, female beds. Um, I'm not in a position, Kevin, to say uh, how many of those beds could be repurposed. I think it's, as I said earlier in the press conference, I, I think it's uh, there's too many uncertainties right now. With the courts opening up, um, we're testing our facilities. Uh, Marble Valley is being mass tested today. Um, um, we're a little concerned um, about potentially we have another outbreak in a facility um, to keep the space open for us to be able to manage those outbreaks so we don't get a situation that looks like uh, Mississippi. So I, I know you're looking for an answer. Uh, how can I repurpose those beds? But, but the conversation is much more complicated than that because of our our, our makeup of how we're managing um, the pandemic here in Vermont. Um, so what I will say to you is, is that uh, in our morning briefing this morning with the leadership team, we're starting to run some scenarios around. If we have an outbreak here in Vermont, what would we do? And um, if, if, uh, if, if we had to bring folks back, what would that look like? But we're, we're far from having recommendations to the secretary and the governor about how we would do that because it's just not that simple or plain to repurpose beds. Okay, thanks. Um, one other question I had was, do, does Vermont save money by having this contract with Core Civic uh, compared to what it pays and spends for in-state facilities? And if so, could you quantify it? Is it easy to quantify? It, you know, Kevin, that's an interesting question, being someone from outside corrections that didn't really understand the processes when I came on board in January, because I've heard these figures thrown around and, you know, what I will tell you, it's about twenty-six to $27,000 per inmate per year in our relationship with, with Core Civic. I've heard these numbers thrown around about what it costs to house an inmate in Vermont. Um, but here, here's the interesting um, factor is that, um, you know, I think the way people come up with that figure is they look at our budget they take an average of how many inmates and they divide it. And that's not an accurate way of doing it because I, I could have the population down like it has been um, for the last couple of months and there isn't significant savings because I still have to maintain the building. We have to maintain a staffing level. We have a benefit package we pay to our employees. Um, we may save a few dollars on food and other incidentals, but you still have to have the facility up and running. So it's very hard to quantify quantify uh, what that cost is. There is a cost to have people in uh, facilities out of state um, that are real cost. Putting the, putting the price that are real cost back here is a little bit more difficult from where I sit. Now other people may say they can figure that out, but I, my seven months here, um, I don't see where you can figure that out unless you close a facility down. Okay. Um, and then lastly, yesterday you mentioned something to the uh, Judicial Oversight Committee about how the, back in April you had shared the protocol that Vermont was uh, working with with the folks down in Mississippi. Can you clarify those remarks and expand on them a little bit? I, I, I'll say the same thing I said yesterday to the Legislative Committee that um, staff has told me in April uh, when we started working on protocols, um, right around the uh, period of time when we had the outbreak at the Northwest facility, that we shared copies of our protocol with the folks in Mississippi. I really have no more detail than that, Kevin. 
So I think that could that could have been a little more than just forwarding an email. I, again, I have no more detail on that as I sit here. Um, okay, so staff have told you that they shared it with folks in Mississippi, but you don't know uh, any more than that. A, a copy of the protocol was shared with Corps Civic in Mississippi. Okay. Thanks for, thanks for your time. You're welcome, Kevin. Take care. Yeah. All right, Kathy, the Associated Press. Kathy, Associated Press, it's star six to unmute. All right, if we have no Kathy, we'll go to Riley at the Burlington Free Press. Can you hear me? I can. Great. Um, my question is for Dr. Levine. Okay, go okay. ahead. So, yeah, <laughs> thank you. So, so if I understand correctly, you suggested earlier that there is a risk of backlog on tests and that tests should be um, reserved for certain, certain individuals who have experienced certain circumstances and that um, and that certain individuals should be prioritized and people shouldn't just be shouldn't just be getting tests um so i'm curious about the the pop-up sites around the state that are that are indicated to be for asymptomatic individuals who um you know who should be prioritized at those pop-up testing sites and what uh what what individuals should be should be seeking out tests at those sites sure no that's a great question um, so some of the pop-up sites are regularly scheduled pop-up sites, if you will, and some of them are actually uh, purposefully scheduled because there's an outbreak in an area. Uh, but clearly, uh, we do prioritize coordinating a community response to an outbreak um, as part of the role of the pop-up in that region. Um, Without, a, without an outbreak in that region, obviously that's less of a concern. Uh, there are many people in the state who are not symptomatic but who are required to have testing. Some of them may actually be the people we've just been talking about, uh, officers or other staff in the correctional system, uh, for, one, for one example. Um, there are also um, other vulnerable populations that people care for or are interacting with that require them to have testing at a more frequent level. And they are asymptomatic as well. So they are good candidates uh, for these pop-up sites in, in general. And um, there are people in the state who have a purpose for their testing, even if they're asymptomatic, uh, but that's not because they deal with a vulnerable population. They may be people who are uh, trying to get out of quarantine, for instance, or They've been in a uh, contact tracing exercise where they were the contact and uh, want to be tested regarding that. Uh, so they would be eligible to go there too. Although I would add that we are trying to steer many of the asymptomatic individuals to a multitude of other sites, whether it be their primary care office, a federally qualified health center, our new relationships that are beginning to develop with pharmacies, um, urgent care centers, etc. So um, the pop-ups are not by any means the exclusive place that uh, we would prioritize any of those people going because there may be other opportunities that are convenient for them as well. Thank you. I had, I had one quick follow-up, which is you mentioned that officers uh, or individuals who work in correctional facilities would be um, would be candidates to be tested at these pop-up sites in the case that they potentially had an interaction with someone with COVID. Would would the correctional facilities not coordinate some sort of testing procedure themselves in that situation? Yeah. So when you just heard that one of the facilities is being tested, so we generally uh, do the testing on site there. But it doesn't mean that every person who's on the staff was there at that moment. 
you know, because they all work different shifts or they may be away on vacation or what have you. Uh, so there may need to be access for those individuals to get their testing done at a time other than when the facility was mass tested, if you will. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for tuning in. Stay safe this weekend and uh, mask up.